On the other side of toxic Christianity, I found myself faced with one question. Now what? This podcast is about that question. We have conversations with folks who are asking themselves the same things. We're picking up the pieces of a fractured and fragmented faith. We're finding treasure in what the church called trash, beauty, and solidarity in people and places we were told to fear, reject, and dismiss. I'm Tammy Spencer-Helms, and this is Life After Leaven. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to this episode of Life After Leaven. I'm your host, Tammy Spencer-Helms, and I am finally joined by the one and only Sarah Quint. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Sarah, and then we're going to jump into the episode. Sarah is a citizen of the Mataconai Nation of Sinacomica in Turtle Island, which is Virginia, USA. Uh, She's faithfully working towards a decolonized and contextual practice of the Jesus way. Uh, This integrative journey has led her into traditional storytelling and songwriting in her tribal tongue. Sarah is currently the co-pastor along with her husband, Steve at Monroe City Church in Monroe, Michigan, traditional Potawatomi territory. Is that right? Cool. Um, So hello, friend. Hello, my friend. Oh, I'm so good. I've been anticipating this day for a while and loved when you threw the topic out. I was like, oh, no, here we go. Here we go. And so we the show has been about I've been introducing the first season has been just about introducing the listeners to the beloved community that I landed in. And what I love about doing this and featuring my friends in the first season is that Um, We know that this leaven, this toxicity that is inside of our faith systems, our theology, the ways that we think about God, one of the hardest things to do once you've unleavened or gotten yourself out of that is to figure out what now, what do we do? And so what I love is that I've come into contact with so many beautiful people who are figuring that out. And a lot of us are doing that together. And that being said, Everyone has probably mentioned you so far on the show. So I'm so (laughs) glad to have you because you've been such a good uh, friend and teacher um, and sojourner and listener um, for me and for so many others of us um, who have been interviewed. So I guess I'm going to ask you the same question that we ask everybody, which is uh, what does life after 11 look like? So what does it look like? What did it look like before? Um, and now what does life in God, uh, life of faith look like now that you've unleavened? Yeah. Thank you, Tamise. Um, yeah, our, our community is rich. We, yeah. uh, it's been a beautiful community. So, um, <laughs> I'll try to not get sheepish at the fact that I've been mentioned a couple times, but, <laughs> um, yeah, life after 11, um, it's good. I highly recommend it. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because before before 11 or before I was, you know, out of, you know, white supremacy and started to even see different forms of theology and meeting people like yourself and um, some of the other friends that have been on the show, I think like white Western leaven left me segmented would be the best mm. way to describe life before just dissected, disconnected from myself from place, um, from others. Like there was just so many fractions, even down to blood quantum, (laughs) Um, you know, that just like fractioned me and pieced me apart. Um, The only thing that mattered as an indigenous woman in that space was, you know, the salvation of my pagan soul. Mm. That was the only part of me that mattered, but like my flesh, my people, this place, my connections to all the relations around me, none of that seemed to matter in those places. And and if anything, it's not that they didn't matter, they were even vilified. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there was this just massive disconnection. Mm-hmm. Um, and on my way out of that though, um, it was really black womanist theologians, liberation theologians that really actually helped me to connect first back to myself, like my physical self. Wow. Um, and for the first time, like the gospel became news to good news to this Mattapani flesh mm. um, specifically. Um, 
and that that good news really sunk in <laughs> for the first time in all parts of myself and i feel like that was the first point of reconnection mm-hmm. was just to myself and i'm not going to say that i've arrived in that way um but that process has far begun and it's beautiful and it's worth it and it's been wonderful um but then indigenous theologians came and where you know black theologians connected me to myself and to my person i feel like indigenous theologians took the step to connect me to place and to all of the relations there and so it's like really piecing it all back together um Mm. and making me whole again Mm. um so you know i think about you know the bible talks about like worshiping the lord in spirit and in truth and then Mm -hmm. you know with all of your your heart and your soul and your strength i feel like levin didn't allow me to come from a place of integrity because it was so piecemealed Mm -hmm. um and so life after that being more whole i can actually come with my whole self um as a whole person um and be and then you know a worshiper of integrity in that place so life after 11 looks like wholeness looks like connection Mm. um and there's just this deep like holy integrity Mm. um, of being fully present with myself Mm -hmm. um and spirit and all of creation Mm. Um, so it just it feels like wholeness and integrity wow and that's so interesting because that has come up i mean those phrases either integrity wholeness freedom um Mm -hmm. even some of the uncertainty and people finding even rest in the uncertainty Mm -hmm. of things being kind of these byproducts of the unleavening process was there so for some folks it was a gradual sort of Mm -hmm. something's not right (laughs) over time um but for others Mm -hmm. of us like for myself and a couple of others it was Trayvon that really was a moment that woke me up what what was it for you was it gradual was there a moment that kind of woke you up to like kind of show you that your theology your faith was piecemealed it was fractured um was there a moment or I think for me like I was you know reading your story um I I I hear you say like Trayvon's death was an upheaval of everything like Mm -hmm. it really was a flipping point Mm -hmm. but even before that there were I can hear in your story moments that were still like leading to that point Mm -hmm. of that tipping point that breaking point I think mine was pretty similar okay in that way um the further it really started the further I moved away from home so I grew up in Virginia um and then my father's job transferred me um and my family uh to North Carolina, and then I went to school in Tennessee, and then uh, married a person from Michigan. So my husband and I now live in Michigan, and it just seemed like the further I got away from home, um, the more I realized that like this faith that I was walking in um, wasn't for my people. Wow. <laughs> and when I say for us, like it wasn't for us in the sense that it was not very useful. Mm-hmm. But also it wasn't for us in the sense that it didn't care about us. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I I think that was a part of it. But when I moved to Michigan, actually, people always say like, oh, you lived in the South. Like, that's where like racism is like so thick and strong. And like, I saw it, of course I saw it. Um, But man, I moved into a Midwest town that I have never been in a more outwardly proudly boldly racist place than this um to you know all people of color but specifically how it expresses itself to indigenous people you know i moved to a town that's known for um general custer who Mm. uh, helped with the genocide of native people in north america and there's this massive statue of him in the middle of town um there's you know schools named after him and there's roads named after him and the town itself is 94 percent white Mm. um and so i have a list on my phone of all the natives i've met and uh all the ones i thought were natives but were actually just white people pretending to be natives so that they could get grant money and all this other stuff and it's down so that list has gotten smaller um and it's down to about five people in town so 
to be that fraction and that small here, um, it felt very oppressive. And I didn't have my community um, to really lean into and um, be in those safe spaces and connect regularly with my family and my tribe. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of like the lead up, but my tipping point really, it was a fork in the road because in all of this, I've never lost my love for Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's committed, it's fierce. I mean, I can't, I can't deny the him and the work that he's done in my life and the presence that's constant, even when, even throughout all these confusing and hard things, mm -hmm. um, I just, I can't, I won't, it would be like, it'd be like looking back at my mom and being like, yeah, you didn't, you didn't make me, you didn't mean anything for me. You didn't raise me. You didn't right. sustain me. Like it feels that deep. Like I just, I couldn't deny yeah. that. Um, and so in the in the thick of that leaven though i was feeling like you cannot be native and christian mm. that felt um like they were oil and water for each other because that's how it was presented yes and so i thought i was being devoted to jesus i really did when i was like god if you don't want me to be mad mm. you don't want me to be a native woman like you just let me know like you tell me i'll do anything for you i'll you know i'll serve you in this way and at the time i really thought it was coming from a deep devotion to jesus but i didn't realize is i was just being devoted to the system mm -hmm. um to this denomination and their viewpoints mm -hmm. and i thought you know i thought those were one and the same mm -hmm. <laughs> but they're not <laughs> um and so i had a prayer one night i won't go into it um but i will give you know the listener somewhere they can hear about it but i went to bed one night and i literally i was at such a conflict and war within myself um it was affecting my health um it was what i went to bed thinking about it's what i woke up thinking about um i just felt like i had to hide in plain sight um it was it was really hard and so i went to bed and i just prayed that prayer i was like god if you don't want me to be native i will i'll like i'll forget it all like i'll just i'll walk away yeah um, if that's what you want, but if you want me to be native, I need you to like, I need a billboard. I need something loud and clear because <laughs> right. like, there's, there was nothing around me saying that that was okay. Yeah. Um, wow. I look back on myself now with a lot of compassion in that moment, but there's times that I chuckle because I've come so far from that, but there's still, I have to have compassion for that version of Sarah, um, mm -hmm. because there really was nothing around me, like showing me another way or hope and that I wasn't exposed to anything else. Mm. And I went to bed that night and the Lord was faithful and gave me a dream. That was my billboard that I needed. That was like, just showed me like, I intentionally made you from this clay, mm -hmm. from these waters, from this place, put you in this tribe. And like, let's not call anything that I've made holy and good and pure. Like, this is good. Um, and so I, there was a dream. And so if anybody wants to hear more about that wrestling in that moment, especially if you have, you know, any other, you know, native listeners and stuff, I tell this story more in um, Jen Kenny's podcast called uh, Story Power Podcast, episode nine. Story Power. And Jen Kenny's also a friend. So yes, and, yeah. and I'll probably link that in the show notes too, so people can hear it. Yeah, I think so it's, it's episode nine. Episode <laughs> but that nine. was my that was really my turning point, and I woke up and I was like, okay, that's what I needed to hear. I'm good. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm thinking about how to segue into this conversation about um, what it means to embrace land and ancestry and indigenous spirituality. Uh, because I'm thinking about all the things that a person experiences when they feel like following Jesus means letting go of the things that make me me and mm -hmm. how devastating that is for indigenous folks, for people of color, um, because essentially that's the only thing you really have to hang on to in a world that whiteness creates. Um, and so yep. for white Jesus to ask you, to lay that down, mm -hmm. there is a real, um, it's kind of a soul crushing thing <laughs> to have to do mm -hmm. or to feel like you have to do and the willingness to do that because you love Jesus, right? Um, 
So can you talk to us about what would it, what would it have been like for you had you been allowed to embrace land, embrace ancestry, and embrace indigenous spirituality and bring that sort of into the conversation? Because we know that most of us are doing that now. Um, so can you talk to us a little bit about that? How do we embrace those things as followers of Jesus? Yeah. I don't, I don't know if there's a single comparison. Mm. Like there's, once you've like, once you begin to live in that way, connected in place to yourself um, in a lot of indigenous uh, spirituality, we talk about the seven directions. Mm. Um, we talk about the circle of life in the seven directions. So not just north, south, east and west, but we're talking about our connection to above us, to the spirit, our connection right here, right mm -hmm. into the center, to the core of who we are, to ourselves, and then connection downwards to place mm -hmm. and to the land. Um, and when you realize that it's Jesus that holding, that's holding all of that together and then spiriting all of that, mm -hmm. you suddenly can find God and connect with God no matter where you go. It's not on a pew only. It's not in this specific bible study only it's not in this specific way to pray it's not like jesus is everywhere mm -hmm. um and why would you ever go back from that mm -hmm. <laughs> um to another place but one of the things that when i was reading your book specifically it kind of tore at me um you know just with your own traumas and your um, tendency to dissociate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and just kind of float above it all Mm -hmm. um and like that's what whiteness does to yes. us it just so when i talk about that fracturing that disconnection it makes us dissociate not only from our flesh like ourselves but even from place mm -hmm. like that's another that's another way that it's dehumanizing like we think about how whiteness has um, dehumanized the indigenous and black bodies mm -hmm. um taken away their dignity um killed them, harmed them, you know, enslaved them, all these things. But there's another dehumanization that takes place when we are not connected to land. Because at the end of the day, we have only ever been people of the dust. We have only ever been earthlings. We have only ever been placed here to, to see God here, commune here with spirit. And so when we disconnect from that, like, you know, I feel like it's, we're just dissociated we're floating above everything and not connected to anything um mm. and so where the black theologians and womanist theologians connected me to myself my physical body which was like so important it was i i mean i can't understate that i feel like the next natural step in this process of decolonizing, this next natural step in leaving Levin is to actually connect to place as well. It's it's becoming fully human. Mm -hmm. And we talked about, you know, we talk about the land as home. Like for so long for black bodies, your body was your only home, right? Like that was your yeah. only true home, right? Like, <laughs> like you had to love yourself because like, you're, fr you're distance from the motherland. You have never been fully accepted here. You have never been introduced to this earth, this place in a natural, loving way, mm. right? And so there's like, this has to, this frame, this structure, this has to be our home. And like, I get that, I get that. <laughs> and I understand that, um, but I feel like one of the things that it has done is it's left our theology just hoping for a home in a faraway place like i'm going up yonder or swing low sweet chariot or you know this this place is not my home and i can understand deeply why that type of theology would come from these experiences in this place but like I'm wondering what it would look like if this place that God created and put us in could be home again. It could be a, on earth as it is in heaven. So good. That is so good. 
I'm wondering about it, like I'm thinking about one of the conversations that we've had that was really profound for me was this sort of conversation about my Blackness in relation to the land. And I know we talk about it at the end of the book, or I talk about it at the end of the book, because it was a, you know, it was a new concept for me to think that, hey, I've come back to myself, come back to my body, Mm -hmm. come back to my Blackness but haven't necessarily come back to the land. And it came up in this conversation yeah. about actually gardening and hiking and all of these things. Um, so so for for those of us who are, are Black folks, um, mm-hmm. why do you think it's important for us to, to come into contact and to come into relationship with our Indigenous brothers and sisters in particular? What do you think the dynamism is mm-hmm. in, that, in that conversation? Yeah, I um I just I want to start off by just saying like I don't think indigenous people specifically of North America, I don't think we have exclusive rights mm-hmm. um to theologies of land and place. Mm-hmm. Um I think that's a human right to connect. Um I think it's a it's it's just human. But it can be foreign to people who have never been exposed to it. Wow. Um, and so I do think that's where when we talk about like living in reciprocity, like I'm so forever grateful mm-hmm. to for what blackness has brought to the theological discussion when it comes to my flesh, my yeah. person, my body. Wow. Um, and how this can be home. But like, what can we give back? Like you gave us like this here flesh. How about this here land, this here mm-hmm. place? Like, can we give that back to you? Yeah. And so it's not that we have this exclusive right. We just we have lived continuously in this place Mm -hmm. there's a there's a continuous relationship we know in part if not in like in full just because we have had our own harms we have had our own displacements we have you know had uh, access denied and things like that but there's still a continuous history here Mm -hmm. Um, no matter how fragile or fractured it has been or harmed it still exists and so it's almost like an invitation like to we can introduce you to this place Mm -hmm. um, in that way um i never set out to be like some like sacagawea (laughs) (laughs) so please people do not get in my dms and be like can you help me connect to like like, (laughs) i don't know (laughs) it's not my it's just (laughs) but for my friends yeah for those people that i generally have like relations with um I had no, I just did, I didn't have any idea how that wound was so, yeah. so deep yeah. in my Black friends' lives to the point where we could talk about some of the hardest things on planet Earth. Mm-hmm. But the second we talk about disconnection from land, mm-hmm. silence, tears, shutting cameras off, like I can't even talk about this mm-hmm. because it was such a tender point. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, Oh, and I found love in there. Mm-hmm. I was like, I had no idea wow. that it affected this much, this deep. Mm-hmm. And so it's, I, I think it's the natural next step. And I love that you, you end your book on the land acknowledgement mm-hmm. because like I see your process through the whole book and you end with this land acknowledgement. And there's like so much hope in that because it does feel like that natural next step mm-hmm. and becoming human yeah. again. <laughs> And feeling like really connected is is the land connection. Mm. Um, it makes me think about uh, you know when you know they the children of Israel when they were liberated from bondage in Egypt, mm-hmm. they still had to find place. Mm. There was before they could really get to Shalom. Yes, liberation was like absolutely essential first step but they still wandered until there was a place Wow! and and it wasn't about being rich it wasn't about wealth like oh now we can have this many herds or this is we own this we own that i think that it was relational wealth like they they knew that water they knew that earth they knew what the morning smelled like they they knew what plants grew there they knew like and i think that's the next step for so many people mm. is connecting to place. 
so often something that I've learned in my journey when I feel like divine wisdom enters a space I just take a little minute to let it rest in the air um mm -hmm. because that is profound to me um yeah there needs to be a conversation had in tenderness about this and I, i've i've really it's so funny that you <laughs> that you um mentioned that because i've been thinking about writing again and like writing again <laughs> right, in real time and honestly it has it starts with like ooh, a grounded embodied faith what does that look like and how do i grow from this place and um, so for you to say that and to talk about ending on land acknowledgement, I think there is so much um, healing, for particularly for Black people, I think, um, right. and putting our hands in this dirt, um, knowing where it grows, eating from the, the area in which we live, eating produce from that area, and starting to implement those things. And there is a wholeness. There's a it's hard to explain, but there's, there's a sense of, you're right. Like, it's like, I guess a sense of place to know, like I'm receiving yeah. my water from the James river. Um, and these are the plants that grow in my specific area, um, that I'm stewarding. Right. And it, it happens that, you know, in the, in the end of the book, we talk about how this is your land that we're living on. And that mm -hmm. was kind of our entrance into, or mine particular entrance was like, oh, this is auntie Sarah's land. So that means we take care mm -hmm. of it a certain way. And like that kind of led this conversation of like, do we grow our own food and what kinds of foods do we eat? And how do we say grace before our meals? And, you know, what do we say at night? You know, we, we're stewarding mm -hmm. land here. Um, and so I really appreciate that. I'm thinking about how to continue to have conversations and to continue to have you come help people think through so they won't be in your dms um think through how <laughs> how do we do this together and how do we do it well um because i think there's work even for white people around this yeah. um around even coming sure. back to some sort of i don't even know what that would look like i mean what does that look like for white yeah. people I think Randy, Dr. Randy Woodley. Yeah. Um, we'll have to. I'll have to find the name of his book because he wrote like four books or something yeah. last year. Yeah, <laughs> he was, was flying. <laughs> <laughs> but one of them, and I read all of them, so they're smushing together. Um, <laughs> was talking specifically about when we talk about decolonizing and indigenizing. Yeah. How it is different the approach to that is different depending on your location your social location okay for a black break person that down. break that down for a black person how do they how, what do they what hurdles do they need to overcome mm. to connect to this place right now mm -hmm. for an indigenous person from north america mm. how do they connect and what are their hurdles and then for someone who comes like in whiteness um in dominance uh through empire how do they decolonize and indigenize that's those are three completely different stories i think the the home is the same like the the final landing point is the same but how we get there is different and so um i will do my due diligence and find out the name of that book we'll put it in the show notes for everybody but the that is the understanding is mm -hmm. that it is you're right to say like the work is different for everybody mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. but i think i was thinking the other day it actually it was strange because when we were thinking about this conversation 40 acres and a mule mm -hmm. kept popping up in my head and something about that has always disturbed me and i'm like mm -hmm. but is it allowed to disturb me because i'm like of course i want you know, my black relatives to have a place and to have autonomy and to be able to live in this land and eat the fruits of this land and stuff like that. And it finally dawned on me that like, 
those 40 acres mm -hmm. and a mule are still a way to approach connecting to place through empire, mm -hmm. through whiteness, because it's stolen 40 acres. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, you know what? Mules cannot reproduce either. Mm -hmm. It's one and done. There is no future. There is, there is no true life in that. Like it is, it's over. And I'm like, is that really what I did at my core? I'm like, you know what? From my friends that I know, the black nation, that's not what they really want. Mm -hmm. Of course they want home and place, mm -hmm. but they don't want it that way. Like come correct, come right, come in, in integrity and honesty. And I do think that's where natives and the way that we interact with this land and reciprocity mm -hmm. and in and, and love and humility that's where that knowledge can come from mm. but it's like come what if you can approach instead of connecting through this 40 acres and a mule who can't reproduce what if you approached it through true relationship mm. um and there being no mediator and whiteness isn't and whiteness and empire is no longer the mediator for your connection to this place that's what i think you really want Am I putting words in your mouth? <laughs> Speak to that. Like, isn't that what you really want? Like an yes. honest, genuine, one-to-one -one connection yes. to this place. Wow. I mean, you know, you just hit me with something, so I have no thoughts. I'm not, <laughs> but I'm thinking yeah. about, so for folks who don't know what 40 Acres and a Mule is, it was a promise made around the time that the first kind of iteration of freedom around emancipation happens. And all of the formerly enslaved were promised, you know, 40 acres and a mule of their own, right? To, but basically it became a sharecropping system. And again, reconstruction, right. all those things happened. So it didn't last very long. And so it is the kind of the beginning stages of a conversation about reparation. And what Sarah is saying is like, why do we even need the empire to mediate land they don't own in the first place that no one owns? Um, right. And, and that to me feels like I have never thought of what it looks like to find place without empire giving it to you. Yeah. You know, and in a way that's very, I can see whiteness all over that because it is here, not there. Us, yep. not them. You know, yep. it is still very... Um, binary and separated and individualistic i don't know how we have and it feels to me even more like a conversation that can't be had without everyone at the table owning their relationship to land how it was broken and and us kind of helping one another figure out what it means to be reconciled and yeah you know because I think I don't I I have no idea. I just think about the fact that like you you've said before about how water the same water has been here. You know, and these ideas that I think people have not thought through, but I don't know of another way forward. Um mm -hmm. So I'm like kind of I'm blown away by this question. And I and I'd love to speak to that, like that coming to this with tenderness and compassion that you're sitting here going, I don't know another way forward. Like this sounds, yes, this sounds good, but like how? I don't yes. have an imagination for this. Yes. And I think of prophetic imagination mm -hmm. and how that's so necessary in times like this. Mm. But I don't want to erase ourselves as indigenous people. Mm. because I do think that's why you instinctually are saying everyone needs to be at the table including the indigenous people of this land mm -hmm. because what if prophetic imagination isn't necessary mm. if we would just listen to the indigenous people who already know the answers to these questions but we've been separated we have been denied we have been silenced mm. what if every richness and truth that we need is already here and if we could just reconnect because that's like the theme that just kept coming up over and over again is like 
whiteness to me is a fracture. It's a splinter. It disconnects relationships. It consistently steals children from their mother. Mm. And not only in through slavery, not only through our, you know, for North American indigenous people through forced adoptions outside of that and through the boarding schools experiences, but it has disconnected us from mother earth. Like mm. it tries to take us from that, that first womb. And I'm like, what if, what if it's the answer is everything through relationship? What if that is the way home is to restore relationship and the truth will be there. And what you don't know, somebody else does. And we can share that together. Um, yeah, I, I, I just trust that it's all here mm -hmm. and it doesn't, it doesn't surprise me. And I want to, like I said, I want to approach this with tenderness. Like when you say, I don't even know what that looks like like really being a part of a place. I mean, like the rice paddies, mm. the tobacco plantations, the cotton fields. No, that's not home. That's not the relationship it was supposed to be. Mm. And now, you know, the redlining and all this, all the things that just continues to say, you don't belong here. Mm. Like, of course, that's hard to imagine because that experience has never has been stolen from you. Mm -hmm. um, but I, there are people here who don't have to imagine mm. is what I'm saying. So like, wow. <laughs> come on in, <laughs> like, let's share this knowledge. Mm -hmm. I promise you, you're not going to find it in the White House. I promise you, you're not going to find it through, you know, the people who run the national parks. Like, you're not going to find it through whiteness. Like, See. I promise. <laughs> so don't, don't try it. <laughs> Ooh, oh my gosh Sarah you make me think of that verse in Deuteronomy 30 where Moses it, it, Moshe tells the people um it's not up here to say we will go up and get it right it's not over there so that we have to go on this long journey no the word is near you it's in you right. so that you could do it it's very near and the idea that that even back then this idea of like what you need is right here right and i think there's a testament yeah. there's a there's a witness of that in the fact that we can eat from this land right you can yeah. build shelter from this land what you need is right here um it's right here say but la. you said it you say say la say la <laughs> but you said it even in your land acknowledgement you you the initial part in your land acknowledgement you quote genesis chapter 2 verse 1 before mm -hmm. anything was on earth water used to come up from the ground to water it mm -hmm. it was already here was already like here. life was here and it can come from the ground mm -hmm. it can come from this place like mm -hmm. mother has not gone dry like she is still nursing, she is still caring, she is still tending. And she's calling all of her children home, like, and we all have a right to partake in that. Mm. That water from the earth is here. Mm. Say la. <laughs> so now do y'all see why we are all incredibly honored to call Sarah Quint our friend and teacher and auntie and sister and all the things. Um, you just, it's, it's, it's not even like, you know, I think about how I used to be um, moved when I was in whiteness and my faith was leavened and it used to be sound bites and zingers, right? Now it's witness of spirit. It's how grounded, how, how drawn do I feel into, I don't know anything, but I'm so excited to just journey and grow. Um, and I think that to me is one of the clearest things um, Unleavening has done because the things that you say, they rest around and with and on and they draw you towards creator. They're not like Ooh, that's going to be a bestseller as a singer and it's a good tweet. <laughs> you know, it's always like a very transactional capitalistic way of doing things. But now 
I'm just finding if I'll let it, the spirit will let things like just sit on me Mm -hmm. um, and bear fruit over time. Um, And I love, love, love being in relationship with you because lots of times you're the one that precipitates that (laughs) or something you say or a question you ask or something you're wrestling with. And so I just thank you um, for sharing with us and going to end our episode with the same question we end every episode with the same three first question is what are you bringing from the rubble second question Mm -hmm. is what are you binging and the third question is Mm -hmm. um any words to live by and I wanted to ask you if you'd be willing to tell a story as your words to live by because I love when you do that I love when you tell us stories um Mm -hmm. So, yes, yeah, so we'll do those last three questions and then we'll have you tell us where we can find you. Any order you like. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. What am I bringing from the rubble? Um, I am bringing my love for the word of God. Mm-hmm. And I know this is a very tender spot for so many people mm-hmm. in this movement. Um, it has been a tender spot for me as well, mm. but I love story. I love story that's grounded in place. Um, I love story that refuses to disconnect mm-hmm. spirit and place and people and creation. Mm-hmm. And I find that in, in the Bible. Um, I have had to do a lot of <laughs> learning how to reapproach it in a different way. And uh, I'll be the first to admit that <laughs> a lot of that, um, how I hold it is different, how I, how I approach it is different, mm-hmm. but I still love it. Mm-hmm. I still love it. I mean, me and you rapping back and forth, even today, like mm-hmm. it, there's stuff that still brings up and we're like, there is goodness here. There's, mm-hmm. there are verses that connect us to these truths that we are explaining mm-hmm. even now. Um, so I'm definitely bringing that with me. Um, yeah, that and just a continual connection to the spirit. So I come from some Pentecostal places Uh, and like, I, one of the things that it did introduce me to or continue to allow me to function in is that the spirit is always with me, Mm. um, accessible Mm. everywhere. And I think that fits very well with indigenous theology anyway so i'm like um also i can't live without it (laughs) so so i'm gonna stay with that i'm bringing that which is really like that's the only thing that withstood the fire was (laughs) was the refining fire was the holy spirit so i mean no surprise there Mm -hmm. no that's right no that's right um yeah where uh what am i binging right now um i have been really binging a lot of indigenous worship music Mm. um and when i say indigenous i just mean rooted from a a specific place that's just that's not all just like north american Mm -hmm. uh, tribal music um let's see um words to live by so my saying that the spirit brought to me um like three years ago and Mm -hmm. i've just been sitting with it Mm -hmm. hearing it more and more really playing it out how does this actually play out in life is everything through relationship Mm -hmm. everything through relationship Mm -hmm. um you know as a woman who has experienced sexual violence and assault I mean, that is, that is passion and pleasure and love outside of relationship. Mm. You know what I mean? That's a a forced thing as a native person who, you know, is now living in places that have been colonized. um, The, the colony lives here Mm. outside of relationship. Like there is not a genuine relationship to land or the people, original people of the land or the place. Like it's like, And so it really, when I'm like, okay, so what does that mean for me though? Everything through relationship, how it played out is even how I was approaching um, 
re-indigenizing and connecting deeper to my culture, I didn't even realize it. But some of those first moments, like in my, you know, earlier life, I was actually approaching it with this, with whiteness that says, Mm -hmm. I own this, it's mine to have, Mm -hmm. it's my right, Mm -hmm. and just to take, Mm -hmm. Um, which is the first sin, right, Mm -hmm. (laughs) of the garden, Mm -hmm. to, to see and just to take. Oh, um, don't do so, it. You know, that's my joy right <laughs> Don't do it. We're not going to preach. Literally, we're going to Anyway, but let's go, but let's stay in the garden for a second. Mm-hmm. Everything they needed for life and abundance was already there mm-hmm. and it was given to them through relationship. Mm-hmm. And so it really is like, that's what it means. It's like, so when I come and I have something I need to know. I need I have something I need to learn. I'm not just going to approach somebody who is the elder in this, that has the wisdom in this, and be like, give. Mm. I'm going to come like in through relationship, no matter how long that takes. Mm. And it's taught me patience. It's taught me grace. It's taught me humility. Mm. Because what they have, even though I need it, I can't, I'm not going to just come and take Somebody called me for a podcast interview and I had no relations with them. We didn't have a friend of a friend. We didn't have a this person. I like, I don't know who they are. Mm. And I literally told them, no, not yet. Even though the topic was solid, it's something I wanted to talk about. I didn't know them. And it dawned on me, it was even back towards myself. Like, don't let people take from you. Like, don't let them, you know, pull from you, mine from you as a resource. And let, like everything through relationships. So I said, hey, can we get to know each other a little bit? Mm. We took half a year and I was reading their stuff. I'm seeing what they do, how they move in this world, how people are responding to them, how they care for people, all that kind of stuff. Till I got to a point where I was like, we can do this podcast. Mm-hmm. And then we did it, but we did it through relationships. So that's kind of like what that has meant to me. Um, I think of uh, some of my black friends, they say, I don't really know them that way, mm-hmm. which to me is another translation of everything through relationship, right? Like yeah. we don't know each other like that. <laughs> like that. I don't know you like that. <laughs> like that's the, that's the same truth. But then also like when you walk into a, a room or to a home or to an event, when I go um, to my friends of color, when I go to their black homes, I have learned you announce yourself and you say hello to every individual in that room. It don't matter if they're 82 or two, mm-hmm. they matter. That's that dignity that re- like that's a, that's a whole person mm-hmm. in this home mm-hmm. and they matter. And right. so it's like that relationship, but we have something similar. Like when I go into a sweat lodge, the door is low and small. Mm-hmm. So you have to crawl. There's no way to, to walk through. So it's a humble position of entering in, but that lodge is a circle and it represents the whole community of life, the earth and everything in it. It's like the dome. It's like a womb of mother earth. Mm -hmm. And when you walk in, you say hello Mm -hmm. to all of your relations, all Mm -hmm. of your relatives. You acknowledge that, Mm -hmm. that they're all there and they matter. And when you leave, you say, you know, goodbye basically thank you to all of your relations all of your relatives and so like for me it's just like everything through relationship everything and that avoids harm that avoids extraction that avoids all these things that has been pretty negative in our world so that's been my motto i am writing a secret book and it's one of the titles of one of my chapters (laughs) (laughs) but i'm still trying to figure it out (laughs) So tell us where we can find you. Like if people yeah. want to follow, find you, where can we find you? If you want to find me on social, uh, the best place would be on Instagram. Um, once again, everything through relation. So hey. I have pulled back a lot mm-hmm. on how much I put on my socials mm-hmm. um, because I, I find that it's really hard to do things through relationship that way. So if you're looking for like a wealth of resources and constant output, you will not find it there. But if, <laughs> if you want to see three or four posts a year and some of my writings or anything like that, 
<laughs> then you can go on Instagram. I'm at um, Quint, Q-U-I-N-T underscore Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, um, all lowercase, Quint underscore Sarah. That's me on Instagram. You can find um, some of the publications that have taken place. You can find that there. I um, also want to plug, um, there is a man named Dr. Casey Church. He's a Potawatomi um, uh, pastor and teacher, and he runs a contextual ministry out in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico called The Good Medicine Way. Mm. Um, they meet on Monday nights, but I recently went and um, preached there, which was really great. It was a whole like full circle moment because his works and his ministries over the last 20 plus years mm -hmm. have allowed me to get to this place in my own life. So I preached on February 13th of this year and it was called Counting Coup. So if you go to their Facebook page, The Good Medicine Way, you can find um, that sermon there uh, and be able to watch that back and hear a little bit more about those things. So I that's another that I went to that y'all y'all really need to get that good medicine away it was wild it was Ellison and I both listened to that message and like it took a day for it to really sink in all that was brought like it was mm -hmm. yeah that's the thing I <laughs> I've got a personality and reputation now of making people like cry and we just jump in the deep end mm -hmm. from the start. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> can't do yeah. a lot of small talk. <laughs> <laughs> Everything through relationship. I know that's right. <laughs> well, that note. I am so thankful for you, friend. And uh, thank you for, and I know like your moves right now. So it's an honor to have you doing this right now um even though you're like stepping back so thank you um I know that everyone was blessed by this and uh I just appreciate you I really 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 do and uh yeah consider you family yeah so thanks for being on absolutely love you friend can I share some love love back to you yes friend of course you can edit however much you need to edit okay. but um but yeah, I I want to just take a moment to thank you for this work, putting mm -hmm. together Faith Unleavened. I mean, it's, I, I've heard it over and over again, people just, you sit down, you can't stop. You got to finish the story. You just, it's like a, you sit down, you just have to read it. And um, what you welcomed us into, there was parts where I, I could see myself in it. Um, just the compassion and tenderness that you held for yourself in moments where you didn't even like how you were <laughs> acting or what you were putting up with. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But it was so honest and we needed that. Um, we don't need self-righteousness in these moments. We need, we need humility and we need just an honest journey. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, that's what I get from this. And I really just, I love it. I love you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your example that you have lived out has, just resonated to so many people. And it's one that I follow. I consider you a trail sister. Mm. Um, like we are walking this road together. Um, and I thank you for everything that you bring. Um, and I, this could just be for you. Um, you might wanna share it with your listeners, mm. but I was just thinking, this is like the blessing. This is what I want for the black nation. Mm. Um, now and in the future you talk about the lord sets the lonely in families yes you said that over and over again in your work um and how important that has been to you but what if the family is bigger mm -hmm. than y'all ever thought what if it could only be described in entire ecosystems and plant and animal families what if there's that much love mm. on the table for you um and i believe it is i believe that's true mm. um and so my prayer as i have um walked with so many black friends on this road has been that that you would see the goodness of the lord in this land 
as a fully alive person. Yes. Fully alive, fully connected to this mm. place. And you would, you would find a goodness here and I hope it surprises you. Mm. I hope the intensity of the love that you never expected was there. I hope you find it and it surprises you and it is just healing for you. Um, that's my that's my blessing. That's my wish um, for you and your listeners. And I love you. I love you too, friend. <laughs>